It's my privilege to introduce our next moderator, David Ray, horticulturalist extraordinaire from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. And David has been not only a colleague, but also serves on our board of trustees and been a great advisor in, in guiding the direction of the National Tropical Botanical Garden. David. Well, thank you very much, Chipper. Tim, you're so right about a lot of what you said, and I think our panel actually follows on quite well from where you left off, because it's about operational sustainability. We'll never become agents of change if we're not operationally sustainable, and to be sustainable, we need to be relevant. And that's really what we're about this afternoon, trying to make our institutions relevant so they can be sustainable into the future. As Chipper said, I am uh, Director of Horticulture and Learning at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. I've been there for a long time, but I'm also immensely proud to be a board member of the National Tropical Botanic Garden, and I would like to add my congratulations to reaching your 50th anniversary. Well done, indeed. There are about 3,000 botanic gardens in the world, and there's only one thing that they all do, and that's horticulture, culture. They all have horticulture. Most also have terrible education programs, as they were saying, but most have education programs of one sort or another, and some undertake research and conservation. But if you think about it, while there are many botanic gardens, many other heritage or, or historic gardens that are much prettier than botanic gardens, and while schools and colleges teach more classes than botanic gardens, and while most universities undertake more research than botanic gardens, and while government agencies and NGOs do more conservation than botanic gardens, there are no institutions that do all those things together and in one place. But for those that do, it's a unique and winning formula that I think is really, really needed and can work well if the, all those sums come together and are mutually supportive. The National Tropical Botanic Garden does all those things together. They have wonderful facilities. They got an exceptionally enthusiastic and talented staff managed by a dedicated team of leaders and supported by the most incredibly loyal and generous uh, trustees. Botanic gardens, you might be surprised, are being created now faster than at any other time in history, while established botanic gardens are adapting their missions to meet new challenges. But that's not universally true, far from it. Many botanic gardens are struggling financially or failing to connect with audiences, meaning that some are finding it difficult to remain operationally sustainable. But botanic gardens are needed now more than ever, not just for research and, and conservation, vital those they are, but also for engaging with the public to explain the issues of our time, such as climate change and biodiversity loss. There is so much benefit that botanic gardens can give to society and the natural environment, but it's no good if they're not operationally sustainable. Our two speakers, who have a wealth of experience among them, explore the notion that botanic gardens could become an endangered species if they do not adapt to the demands of society and the urgent need for conservation of biodiversity. Sophia Shaw is CEO at Chicago Botanic Garden, and Gaina Coley is Director of Public Programs at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q. Sophia leads one of the largest cultural institutions in Chicago and one of the preeminent botanic gardens of the world. The garden's main campus welcomes a million visitors a year to its 385-acre living plant museum, featuring 26 gardens and 81 acres of lakes and rivers, as well as prairie and 100-acre woodland. The garden is an international leader in horticulture, plant conservation biology, public engagement, and serves as an international model for urban agriculture and horticultural jobs training and education emphasizing programs for a diverse and undeserved community at schools, hospitals, jails, universities, and rehabilitation centers. Really a marvelous outreach and public program It really is relevant. In November 2013, Gay, uh, an accountant by training, joined the Royal Botanic Gardens Q as Director of Public Programs. Prior to that, as we know, she was the Egent Project in Cornwall from 1997 rising to become Managing Director in 2000. Q welcomes over a million, 1.3 million visitors to its 350 acre site west of London and is home also to the Millennium Seed Bank at its other garden in Wakehurst Place. Gay is responsible for managing the visitor experience and leading a team of over 200 staff across the areas of library, 
art and archives, content and engagement, marketing, audiences and communication, and operations and commercial activities. She is passionate about education and aims to make great science and horticulture accessible to all in exciting and inspirational ways. If anybody can tell us about how to make botanic gardens uh, operationally sustainable, it is indeed Sophia and Gaynor. So, Sophia, can I ask you to come and speak, please? As we were coming up to the podium, <clears throat> my seatmate said, said, well, that's a hard act to follow. And I said, well, in fact, I'm a Midwestern girl. I have no act at all, um, but I will try. And I know that all of you uh, will join me in accepting Tim's challenge to be brave. And I also love the words aggressively positive because I am. But I also know that none of the ambitions that we heard about this morning in particular will be possible if botanic gardens no longer exist. So in the next 10 minutes or so, or so, gentlemen, I'd like to provide my thoughts to support the thesis that botanic gardens are not an endangered species. But I will add a caveat. Our institutions are not endangered only if we focus on and truly, truly believe in the unique role gardens play in enhancing people's social, physical, emotional, and intellectual strength. In other words, we will succeed in our conservation mission, we will remain operationally sustainable, we will be financially viable, if indeed, as the title of our symposium suggests, we lead as social agents of change. We need to use the unique power of plants to sustain and enrich the lives of our customers focusing on fulfilling the basic human needs that people everywhere share. I say this and can support it with evidence. I want to show you a graph here of the attendance at the Chicago Botanic Garden since 2005. We've seen an increase of 44%, topping 1 million visitors in 2013 for the first time. Our fundraising revenue from all sources has also increased, and we have done this without hosting a single major temporary exhibition, no chihuly, no dinosaurs, no large-scale topiaries, no live animals, we do not have a carousel, we do not have any playground equipment. We simply devote our programs and ourselves to horticultural excellence, education, science, and community programs, and our attendance in 2014 is now 5% ahead of our record-breaking 2013. Among botanic gardens, our story at the Chicago Botanic Garden is not unique, but I know the statistics at other cultural institutions, art and natural history museums and science centers, for example, are not, at least in Chicago, anything to cheer about. So why are we experiencing these positive trends when other institutions are experiencing declines? This increase, I believe, reflects and depends upon our ability to hone each of our garden's focus and services to address the issues and challenges of our time. Among these contemporary issues, I include anxiety about violence and climate change, economic uncertainty and aging, also the challenges people face in finding consistent access to high quality science education, healthy food, and a place for safe recreation. But gardens can serve people facing these challenges. Gardens are a refuge. We provide comfort. We provide solutions in science education, food security, workforce training, wellness, and climate change. We offer solace to people facing crises and a place to celebrate joy. Gardens will remain sustainable if we see the world's greatest problems as the world's greatest opportunities to serve. Tactically, I think of it this way. We have to put our customers, whether they be our visitors, our students, donors, volunteers, employees, vendors, or partners, at the center of our plans. In the past, institutions whether they be museums, gardens, or universities, have put themselves, their institutions, at the center, reaching out to diverse audiences. I think that's backwards. Don't reach out, invite people in. Put the human being, not the institution, in the center. Think about the customer, and I use this term consciously because 
probably as, as you did, I grew up learning that the customer is always right. If we focus on truly serving people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities from birth through death, we will thrive. Historically, gardens have been located in affluent, mostly white neighborhoods, or even if they are in more diverse neighborhoods, gardens have tended to serve mostly white, generally affluent people, at least in this country. So in order to fulfill our mission and to become operationally sustainable, we must work hard to serve customers who reflect our nation's diversity and commit with all our heart to making everybody feel welcome. Making program changes to welcome and serve all people is at the core of my vision and one of the reasons I believe we've been operationally successful in Chicago. So what can we do? This all sounds good, but what specific actions can we take? So building off of what I just said, I'm going to quickly share 10 examples of changes, small and big, that we've made in recent years that have cumulatively made a difference. My examples fit into these five categories, focusing on the customer's basic needs, emphasizing the importance of our mission, communicating the values on which we're based, taking action to celebrate the diversity of our society, working outside our garden campuses, but more importantly, bringing off-site program participants in and focusing on value. First, a year ago, the Chicago Botanic Garden adopted a new mission statement. We cultivate the power of plants to sustain and enrich life. We wrote this not only to underscore the conservation message and the importance of plants, but to include all of the people who help the garden fulfill its goals. The previous statement was descriptive yet oblique. It didn't even start with a, a real sentence. It just said to promote the enjoyment, understanding, and conservation of plants in the natural world. But who was doing the promoting? Why? And for whose benefit? Yet by emphasizing four words in our new statement, we cultivate, sustain, and enrich, we change that. The words we cultivate now include everyone from our horticulturists to our course instructors to the ex-offenders in our Windy City Harvest Urban Agriculture programs. Sustain refers to the fact that all life, food, clean air, water, shelter, medicine, depends on plants. And enrich gives merit to the mental benefits of our work, acknowledging the commitment of our horticultural therapists and yoga instructors, as well as emphasizing the importance of beauty, community, inspiration, joy, and comfort that gardens provide. My second example is from June 2011. High winds raged all afternoon and night. I received a call at 5 a.m. that the garden's power was out, as well as the power to most of the region. The staff re recommendation was that we close for the day. And as I considered what to do, I thought of that image with the woman in the center. What did our customer need? And there began our day without electricity. We were open for the parents of children in our summer camp, for hundreds of very elderly people arriving in dozens of buses from senior centers without power, and from over 2,000 grateful other people. Third, we have about 30 members of the garden staff who speak only Spanish. You will see them located mostly up in the right-hand corner of this picture taken before we made an important change. We also have about 30 people who are comfortable speaking and reading Spanish more so than English. And we also have staff that are unable to write and read in either language. Yet we did not have a single person working in our administrative team who could communicate with this essential workforce. So I hired a human resources vice president fluid in Spanish you can't diversify your staff or your visitors unless you can have people speak to those staff and visitors. So we can help people to stand with the group in the staff photo rather than along the periphery. Fourth, we created a superb float for the Gay Pride Parade in Chicago, attended by almost a million people cheering us on. Staff and volunteers danced and walked for two hours along the parade route. After the parade, several garden employees and volunteers made a point of saying to me that they finally felt like they belonged. Fifth, the Chicago Botanic Garden is located in an area where many families are Jewish. We have five synagogues within three miles of the garden. We were open 364 days a year. 
We are now open on Christmas Day and host Tuba Shavat and Sukkot programs, recognizing the Jewish springtime planting and harvest rituals, and again, serving and welcoming everyone. Sixth, over the past 10 years, we have built one of the world's largest urban farming jobs training programs called Windy City Harvest. Our 10 farms are located at the City Colleges of Chicago, within the justice system on former public housing sites, public school campuses, other neighborhood sites, and now on the rooftop of our McCormick Place Convention Center. These programs engage a wider garden family of customers from farm to fork. Seventh, and directly related to number six, most gardens and museums have community outreach programs. This is not new. But instead of just reaching out to communities, we must make sure to invite our program participants in to our garden. For example, we join nonviolent ex-offenders from our Windy City Harvest program with our garden campus horticulture teams. And I'm proud to show the evolution of their clothing in the past three years. No longer are they wearing the distinctive clothing that makes them look different than our staff. Students from off-site classroom programs work in our science center laboratories. We aim to serve not just out there, but open our arms and welcome everyone in. Eighth, we've looked at inclusion from every aspect of our business. We now have goals for diversifying our suppliers with women and minority-owned businesses. Again, we can only be successful in being operationally sustainable and building understanding of plant conservation if everyone participates in realizing our mission. Ninth, more and more of our programs serve veterans. Our neighborhood is home to an army base, a naval training center, and a VA hospital. We offer therapy and vocational programs, family reintroduction days, social opportunities, and always rent our spaces to veterans groups for free. And the results, making changes to focus on the diverse but also basic human needs of our customers has yielded result, results and joy. For example, last year we interviewed a sampling of 500 non-English speaking families and found 24 different languages spoken in just one site in the garden in a few hours. While Spanish topped the list, Hindi, Polish, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, and Urdu fell right behind. And for those of you unfamiliar with where our site is, we are in the North Shore of Chicago, not even downtown. And this kind of language diversity was a wonderful example of the diversity that we bring to the garden. And while we have a long, long way to go, we have also seen in increased employee and board diversity. Tenth, offering free admission dawn to dusk 365 days a year is a core Chicago Botanic Garden value. If you bring your car, you pay to park, but you can pack in as many people as you would like. If you arrive on foot, on bike, through public transportation, have a friend drop you off, it's free. We offer music programs four nights and one morning of the week all summer. They are all free. And I get into a surprising number of debates about this. Why don't you charge more, people ask? To which I always respond, a coffee is not a coffee. What? People say, what does that even mean? And this is a concept that derives from my observations of our cafe. Specifically, the earned <clears throat> revenue we make when a visitor buys a cup of coffee at our cafe is almost nothing. But the potential raised revenue, that visitor's membership fee, annual fund donation, capital campaign commitment, possibly a bequest even, from people being happy drinking that coffee is significant. A person who enjoys the experience of drinking a cup of coffee at the garden may write us a check for a million dollars, and that has happened. And it would take selling 500,000 cups of coffee to get to that same result. So my advice is focus not on the transaction of the coffee sale, of the temporary exhibition ticket, the parking fee, or selling an umbrella. Focus on the experience your customer will have when he or she is there, and the rewards will come back to you. In my opening statement, I express the belief that as our symposium topic suggests, garden leaders must be agents, and I added the word of social change. 
but this is not always easy. I use the following value statements on which our strategic plan is built to guide me when I don't know what to do. We believe beautiful gardens and natural environments are fundamentally important to the mental and physical well-being of all people. We believe that people live better, healthier lives when they can create, care for, and enjoy gardens. And we believe that the future of life on Earth depends on how well we understand, value, and protect plants, other wildlife, and the natural habitats that sustain our world. So as leaders of gardens, the historical and present day places of joy, healing, comfort, sustenance, education, and science, it is so important to our future viability that we, one, know what we believe, two, take on a social role, and three, make changes, big and small, that can create a big difference to those we serve and who serve us. Sometimes making changes, leading bravely, or saying no to an industry trend is hard, but the results are wonderful. The effect that we will have on people will secure our garden's operational sustainability, progress our conservation goals, and transform our lives while it transforms those around us. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Are botanic gardens an endangered species? I think we're all familiar with that chap. Many of us have had him in our botanic gardens, as you quite rightly say, Sophia, to attract customers. Um, big, powerful, probably one of the most intelligent animals on the planet at that time, but overtaken by events. Sustainability. Um, we are all searching for that sustainability, not only in our own botanic gardens, but also as a message to take out to the world. And you can see there the things that we're trying to balance. <laughs> That's a different take on the subject. This is Chris Hines. Um, he was the director of sustainability at the Eden Project. Um, and he felt that in order to get all staff, every single member of staff, to get engaged with sustainability, it had to be personal, it had to be funny, and it had to be relevant. But let's back up a bit. So that's what Eden looks like now. Where is it? It's in that pointy end right out in the west of England, and Andy's already touched on the fact that actually taken as a country alone when we were looking to build Eden, it would have been the second poorest country in Europe. So those beautiful landscapes actually disguise a really endemic poverty, a lack of opportunity, partly because of the traditional industries eroding. That's what the site looked like in October 1998, and that's where I came in. So my first confession of the day, I'm an accountant. I don't know how many of you in the room share that curse. Um, but I know that when you go out on a Saturday night, you don't say, I'm really looking forward to sitting next to the accountant. But I had the pleasure at that time of adding the last piece of the jigsaw. I'd met Tim. He'd explained to me how he wanted to build the eighth wonder of the world in this disused clay pit in Cornwall. Um, and I asked him a question that actually kept him silent for, I think, the longest period I've ever known. I asked him a very simple question. How much money do you have in the bank? And he said, we have 80 million pounds in principle. And I said, that wasn't the question I asked you. How much money do you have in the bank? And there was that very long silence and then a cough. And he said, 3,000 pounds. <laughs> so I couldn't resist the challenge. I joined the team. And actually, it was the quality of the idea and the audacity of the idea and the powerful and talented team that pulled it off. And, and when I first met Ian Prance, um, Ian had been described to me as the Elvis Presley of botany. <laughs> <laughs> And I knew at that point, how could we fail with Elvis Presley on our team? 
So we raised the money in March 1999. That's what it looked like. Um, six months later, that's what it looked like. We were the most unpopular project in Cornwall at that point because we had every piece of scaffolding, not only in our county, but in the next county as well. Made the Guinness Book of Records. That's what we looked at like by October 99. And by March 2001, we were open to the public. Two million people came that year. So part of what Tim talks about is, is putting champagne in the veins, the excitement of, of, of doing something, of transforming a site that not only was derelict in terms of its botanic life, but also derelict in terms of its economic life. So back to that pair of pants. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the operational sustainability and how this guy, Chris Hines, encouraged people within the project to think. So the people... We had, a, we had a set of policies that we pioneered, which were actually about recruiting people not based on their past CV, but based on their potential. So about 50% of the people that you see in that picture had been unemployed. A lot of them had come out of the clay industry. A lot of them wouldn't know customer service if you ask them that question. What's your standard? How do you define your customer service? So we interviewed and recruited on the basis of the ability to smile and the, the ability to connect. We put people in a room. We said, you have 10 minutes to entertain us within the bounds of common decency. You can do whatever you like. We gave them one day's warning, one day's notice. People came in with guitars. They came in and told a poem. They came in and sang a song. But you could tell very quickly who could engage the public and who couldn't. And, and Jess, the bottom right-hand side, um, she came in um, into the catering unit by empowering her, her, that smile goes a million miles, I can tell you, and she's now a really successful PR wizard for another company. Malcolm at the top, Malcolm had been made redundant. It was the first moment I think I cried other than raising the last bit of money. Um, and that was when Malcolm came out of an interview a year into the project and he said, I've just recruited somebody and two years ago, I never thought I would work again. Those are moments that stick with you. Um, other policies, access and inclusion makes business sense. All our paths in the project were designed so that everybody could get around every part of the project, um, and we have days when staff go out into the different parts of the project to absolutely test that in reality. We worked with the local supply chain so that we had people building their businesses not only to help our business, but so that their products could go way beyond Cornwall, and that's one of our first successes, a beer. It had to be a beer, didn't it, one of our first successes, um, and that's now listed in, in the national supermarkets across the country, and that company went from employing 30 people to now employing themselves over 200. Um, sustainable construction. How many of you have seen that film, When Harry Met Sally? And there's that bit in the restaurant, isn't there? And there's a lot of noise and a lot of people look. Um, it was a bit like that when, when uh, Dublin on the left-hand side, who was responsible for construction, met Karen on the right. So a lot of noise, but a lot of pleasure because they eventually agreed. And part of what we managed to build was one of the most sustainable buildings in the whole of Britain at that point in time. But so what? So what? We've touched on these global challenges. So what on earth importance is there for a project in that pointy end of Cornwall, in that pointy end of Britain, doing sustainable operations when we have these challenges to face? Big global challenges out there. And combine those climate challenges with a huge financial challenge that we've all been facing. And does our green approach go out of the window? That's really just an excuse to put George Clooney up on the screen. Um, but again, I don't know how many of you have seen that film, A Perfect Storm. And what is it about? It's actually about a leader who is trying to lead his group of friends to economic security. They go after a catch. And I'm going to do a spoiler now. They all die. Sorry, George, it did make me cry when we lost you in that film. But that's an absolute and real failure of leadership. Now, I don't know about you, but I found 2006 really uncomfortable. <laughs> and I would like to suggest that we get back and that we do move back towards the Bridget Jones pants. 
And that actually having our backside covered with more than that little G-string is one of the things that we can bring about. Whether or not you believe in global warming, actually, you've got to believe in common sense and the balance that we have in terms of our lives and our livelihoods right now need the knowledge that we hold to make some of those changes. So, there I was, I'd been at Eden for 15 years. Um, we'd weathered some storms, um, but we were on, on an even keel. And I kept thinking, I'm not quite sure we've got the right power. We have this great big engaging educational program, but somewhere in there was the science, and the science not getting out to our audiences. Now, my dad was a physicist, um, but far more importantly and relevant to me, my mum was a chemist. Um, and my mum grew up in South Wales, which was also a mining community. And she wanted to do chemistry, but she was told in school, women and science don't mix. Do something else. And her father, who was a miner, fought so that my mum could change school and go and do chemistry. And she went on to work in ICI as a research chemist. So we'd always had science in the house, and I thought, when I got approached by Q, I thought, do you know what? If we can add some of that razzmatazz, some of that real show busyness to that absolute weight of science that goes on in Q, maybe that would be a bit more powerful. So there we go, fantastic collections, beautiful visuals, a Christmas series that lights up some of the absolute stunning tree collections. But so what? So our audience is a very typical botanic garden audience. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in the last nine months particularly is bring to that audience things that bring science to the forefront. So how do you do that? Actually, with a bit of sex and drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> we've had different audiences come to see this season. Um, we've made the Daily Telegraph, one of the big uh, broadsheet nationals, um, but we've also made the Sun, which is a red top tabloid, um, and we've had more TV coverage for a very, very small exhibition than we've had in the past five years. But one of the things that I felt, having spent six months at Kew, was that it was a bit like Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels, a giant tied down. And I think one of the challenges that we all have is to actually cut those strings, whether it's small bureaucracy, whether it's fear, but to actually unleash this giant. And so the reference point I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes thinking about maybe is what are the other giants who are out there? Anybody in the room familiar with football? When we arrived at the hotel the night before last, the butler, yes, there was a butler, who took us up to our room, started talking about the football results. It's an international language. Now, I don't speak that international language very well, but I do know that when I look about me, the, the interest and the money and the passion and the commitment and the tribal, tribal sense that people have around the game of football is massive. Could we try and capture that? One of the teams that might dispute that Manchester United is one of the biggest clubs in the whole world is AC Milan, because they've been winning. They have something that we need. They have a sense of competition. They make it dramatic. People get behind it. Barcelona, a stunning arena. Don't we have a stunning arena? Don't we have lots of stunning arenas around the world? Can't we put on part of that battle that we've just been talked about with drama? Plants are green and leafy and we may think beautiful, but they stand still and they do not speak. And part of what we need to do, part of our responsibility in this is giving them a voice, giving them a script, bringing them alive and telling them stories so that that number of people cram into our arenas to see how this battle carries out and whether or not we can win it on a weekly basis. So, in a practical sense, how do we do that? This is one small project, Gardens for Life. This links young people across the globe in a very, very simple project. It's about growing food for life in your back garden. Um, and um, 
just out of the first phase of this project, there was some fantastic cross-global humour. Um, children from Cornwall wrote to, to these children on the other side of the world in India, um, we've got real problems with slugs in our vegetable patch. They wrote back, you must be kidding, we sometimes have to cope with elephants in ours. <laughs> Two other projects, real and practical on the ground, they've worked. Green Foundation, actually not just thinking you can be a catalyst yourself, it's about catalyzing other people in other circumstances. So the first, uh, first cohort of Green Foundation, 300 people in local businesses, funded by the European Commission, um, and out of those 300, 298 went back into their businesses and said they would make changes and that they understood better how to make an environmentally focused and socially focused decision by applying their pants, by being a superhero and putting their pants on to make their business decisions. The group on, the, on this side, the Green Talent, um, that was a joint project between Q and Eden and between um, the, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in the UK, taking young people into natural environments environments and trying to get them to understand how relevant it could be to them. Um, the, when the first cohort um, arrived in, in Cornwall, um, the, the girl on, on the left got out of the bus and she went, it's nature. <laughs> the chap on the right that you see in the cap looking up, after the end of day two, when he'd spent some time with our education team, got really angry. We couldn't understand why he got so angry. And excuse my French, but he shouted at Dr. Joe Redman, head of our education team, you just told me that plants were the only source of oxygen. And she said, yes, that's right. And he said, bollocks, miss, bollocks. If that had been true, somebody would have told me before now. He went on, he went on, he went into uh, Rolls-Royce. Um, we, we work with local businesses and with national businesses. He went into the um, research, research team for, turb for new turbines, wind turbines, and he asked, apparently, more probing questions than that team had been asked because he came from a different context. And two of the guys in that team have agreed to mentor him. He's going back to school and he wants to do science. So that's where I'll end. And my proposition is, if we work together, if we do precisely what Sophia has said and invite people really mean meaningfully into our gardens, but also work out how we can not only be the agents of change, but catalyze people, all people, to love and understand plant science, then maybe we'll be able to craft a beautiful triple bottom line for the world ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you to both Sophia and to Gaynor. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any questions? Do you feel that botanic gardens sugarcoat the environmental message? And how much bad news do you think you can afford to tell? I think the environmental movement have been really effective at telling the bad news. Um, if you look at Hollywood, um, then, then I think that there are lots of people out there who go, crikey, it's going to be some combination of, of Mad Max meets I don't know what, um, when we have a complete breakdown of social structure, everybody for themselves, and maybe there's going to be one hero who fights his way through for his family. Um, and, and I think that story has actually turned as many people off as it's turned people on. So I'm not sure that we haven't told that story. I think the story that we need to tell is the story of hope. And I think that part of our, our responsibility is to turn that sanctuary into a way in which people can understand that it's not just an irrelevant sanctuary which you escape from life, within, but it's somewhere where you can take that sense of sanctuary and build your life and others' lives around that combination. So I think part of what we need to do, and, and Tim touched on it as well, is understand how storytellers take hope and take 
really good models of how we can influence the world. And in essence, that's exactly what Eden was. Can you take a derelict place? Can you breathe some life into it? And if we can do that, ordinary people getting together with yeah, great power and great momentum from, from, from a visionary, but putting skills together, architecture, finance, botany, we transformed a very small place. Can people get inspired by that and do it in their own backyard? And I hope the answer is yes. And, and sorry, just coming back to the chat that asked me about the slides, one of the, the, the books that I've recently read is, is, is about TED Talks and how do you take people with you on that story? Um, and it's about the fact that we're, we're not all verbal. I, I'm, I'm not very good at, at writing down words. I'm a numbers and pictures person. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing we have to also use in the gardens. We were very lucky at Eden that our first operations guy um, was actually dyslexic. And so he used to make sure that people could navigate on the, on the visual signals, not just on the words. And it's those sorts of things, I think, that actually enrich. Have Botanic Gardens done studies to determine what the best way of educating people, getting the word across, what kind of medium should be used? I mean, what, what kind of things aren't we doing that we should be doing when it comes to trying to inform people about crises and also about botanic gardens? Um, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with many uh, botanic garden studies in particular, but the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International have both had uh, work done in evaluating which words are the best to use, um, not only with a broader public teaching about education and, and to the earlier point about what's happening to our climate, um, but also working with children. I, though, find, going back to this idea of collaboration, that the best way to learn what we can do as botanic gardens and education is to meaningfully collaborate with organizations that do know what they're doing in terms of education and really sticking to the core skill sets that the botanic garden has, which is generally horticulture, customer service, and conservation science. And sometimes education is better done in concert with a partner. For example, at the Chicago Botanic Garden, we're working with NASA on a climate change curriculum. NASA information, botanic garden uh, information, talking about plants, and then working with the Chicago Public Schools to test that information. So I don't know if it gets to the question in general, but uh, I think it's important to collaborate with people who know what they're doing already and not to always invent the wheel with a new study. And can I follow up? Because I think um, we've got plenty of scientists in the room. Maybe we should employ our skills of observation on looking at the things that people are drawn to. And, and I would suspect that if we need to learn about how we engage people, we would look to Hollywood, we would look to the computer games industry, and we would look to those things like the Men Who Made America series on Sky HD. That probably has been watched by more young people to understand how you put together leadership and make change than probably the attention that two years worth of history lessons would have. So I think we, we need to be really observant and see where people naturally gather and use and employ those techniques in storytelling rather than transmitting facts and maybe trying to connect with head and not connecting with heart. So use art, use storytelling and use narrative and employ the skills of those who really know how to put it together. D David, back onto the theme of kind of operational sustainability for both our panelists here, and you can throw in too in terms of Edinburgh, all of your organizations get some form of substantial funding from the government. In this era that we live in of uncertainty, I think Chicago's probably got the most certain government funding if there is such a thing. How do you build in resilience and sustainability into, into that formula? I, I know, Gay, you've just gone through a painful process of dealing with that uncertainty. How, how do gardens deal with that? Because many of, many of us, NTBG doesn't, but many of our colleagues do get government funding. Chipper, it's a good question. And one of the things that we've done in Chicago is to try to um, convert that government funding concept that it's not just a, a gift or a grant, um, but we really are focusing now more on contracts and contract services. So what kinds of, of conservation training programs can we offer to 
the Department of Interior Bureau of Land Management that they will then pay us to execute. Another good example of that is working with the Health and Human Services in Chicago to deliver programs to people in the, in the, in the programs in Chicago. So it's, we're, we're actually delivering services and getting paid for them, um, which is a little bit different than actually just taking money. And I think that, that there's a little bit more certainty in that if we can build uh, products that then are then, say, purchased um, by outsiders, we have a more of a strength. The second is really to build endowment. And in the United States, having a strong endowment that supports your organization is really the key to long-term success. If your endowment can be four times the size of your operating budget, it really can help you weather all kinds of, of economic downturns, and, and uh, that's our goal. And I would suggest that that's the goal for all of us. And we don't embark upon capital projects or new initiative or staff increases unless we do have the endowment support to mitigate that risk on the backside. I'd absolutely support that, and, and maybe for, for particularly Kew Gardens at the moment, sum it up in one word, and that is relevance. Um, if we sit behind closed doors and pursue issues that are never well communicated or well understood, then we don't deserve to receive other people's money. If we can actually take our science and make it touch people and make people understand that it is vital and critical, we will get behind us, not only paying customers, but also government and also benefactors. But it's our responsibility to do that and not think that it should come to us without selling the ideas and the proposition. And I'll simply just add to that very quickly to say it's about diversity as well. We, we get uh, quite a lot of government funding, but one thing's for sure, it's not going up. It's been level pegging for a long time and it's likely to stay that forever. So proportionally, it's only going to get less. And it's about diversifying your income streams in all ways, but membership and, and we don't do so much for endowments, but the, the problem with endowments is you get told to use them or lose them. So uh, we uh, don't do that so much, but certainly try to diversify all income streams, but by being relevant, because we are not relevant to society. Like I said at the start, we've got to make botanic gardens relevant to society, and we've got to change to, to meet their needs, both for people and for plants. Uh, a lot of us have had the good fortune to visit both of your f facilities uh, and, uh, and enjoyed them. Um, they're very different, and in Chicago, as you say, you're, you're purely botanical. Um, I don't want to call what you do at Eden gimmicks, but it's, it's a little on the jazzy side, as I say, and of course, we're wrestling this with the NTGB uh, with a small population base, which of course replicates what you have in Devon. Um, so uh, do you make your uh, planning and your strategic plan based on where you are and who you think you can attract and where are you going to get, say, for example, in Chicago to the two million visitor mark? And, uh, and you have already been at two in Eden, uh, which is an area that I, I suspect if it was pure botanical, wouldn't, wouldn't reach those numbers. So how do you, how do you make this kind of uh, balance and planning? I'll start. Um, we build our strategic plan on the core values we want to communicate. And I think I, I, my background has been on exhibitions and education at the Field Museum and, and in other museums. I think I spent so long putting together exhibitions uh, at, at other organizations that were always focused on what is that, uh, that temporary exhibition that's going to drive the attendance or what do people want to see that we became so focused in those other contexts on bringing people in and creating our strategic plans based on operational goals, attendance goals, as opposed to our values. And so at the Garden, um, when I came on about seven years ago, we decided that we would base our strategic plan on what we believed and what we wanted to share and what we wanted to be um, and then hope, and, I, and I, I know that's probably not, the for-profit world would say that that's, that's probably not an intelligent uh, plan, but hope that, uh, that the results would follow. So I don't know if it gets to your question exactly, but I see that by, by being inspired uh, and being uh, passionate and aggressive about having, uh, communicating what we believe in, the other parts follow as opposed to focusing on what we want the end result is in terms of people coming and, and kind of backing into what we believe. Backing in, 
that keeps looking at that. <laughs> yep, and, and I guess the only thing I would add is, is a, a belief that, that is that's slightly complementary to that, which is believing that science is interesting. Um, and if you look at most six-year-olds, if you look at most eight-year-olds, they are really interested, they have a curiosity in understanding how the world around them ticks. Something that we do in the world of mass education is kill that for lots of young people by the time they are 14 or 15. Part of what we can do is open up that world of curiosity if we believe that science is for all and that it is truly deeply interesting. And I believe we will be successful when we have a whole team of botanists that are up there with the David Beckhams, that are paid as much as the David Beckhams and are seen to be heroes in the world because they're fighting that battle on behalf of all their fans. That's our task. And if we can believe in that, people will get behind it and people will come if we make it interesting and engaging. That's been a great discussion. I'd like to thank uh, both our panellists, Sophia and Gaynor. Thank you very much.